Hi, this is David Thornburg, President and CEO of the Committee of 70, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania's force for better government, better politics, and a stronger local democracy. Welcome to We Vote at Home, uh, which is another in a series of experimental programs helping folks to prepare to be uh, to, to vote safely and securely on June 2nd and November 3rd. You know a little bit about the Committee of 70. We go by, way back. We don't look a day over 116, but uh, our job this time around is to make sure that every voter knows uh, the rules of the road and is prepared to vote on, on June 2nd. And we're living in a, in a challenging time, of course, because of COVID-19. Uh, and we're encouraging folks to vote by mail. Uh, if you're not hearing that message yet, it's too late to apply, but we wanna to talk tonight about how you make sure you get your ballot in on time. So tonight, uh, we have gathered an interesting and eclectic and dynamic uh, group of folks uh, to talk through issues about voting at home, about the upcoming races, about the resources that 70 has, and, and to try to energize and inspire you uh, as you uh, sit down to vote, either at your kitchen table uh, at the polls uh, on June 2nd. And to, to kick us off, I'm going to hand things over to my colleague and friend, Chris Satulo, uh, the co-founder of the Pennsylvania Project on Civic, Civic Engagement and all our all-around civic engagement uh, here at the Committee of Seventy. So, uh, Chris, let's uh, kick it off. Okay, thanks, David. And thanks to all of you for joining us this evening, as David said. We have two goals for tonight's event. The first is to give you all the good information you might need to review your vote from home ballot, then to complete it and mail it in successfully. The second goal stems from an observation. While voting from home is unquestionably a good and wise thing in this pandemic moment, it does kind of lack the civic context that can make voting in person sometimes a rich experience. You know like standing in line, chatting with your neighbors, cheerfully fending off the folks trying to give you sample ballots, getting greeted by a veteran poll worker who actually knows your name, maybe taking the kids into the booth to initiate them into the grand ritual of self-government, getting that I voted sticker. All of these things remind us that while our vote itself is private, voting is an act done inside and for community and for rising generations. For very good reasons, some of us are going to miss out on all of that. Many of us will miss out on all of that this year. But we here at 70's We Vote Initiative don't want voting from home to seem a lonely, flat experience. So we're experimenting with ways to foster a friendlier civic context for voting from home, one that also connects us back to the heroes of history whose commitment and bravery have guaranteed us this precious right to vote. So we crafted this idea for a vote from home event that maybe come this fall, any one of you could host for your friends, for your book club, for your sewing circle, church group, block watch, wine club, softball team, whatever you got. And tonight is our first trial in this, a dry run as it were, though if you ever should host one of these, we invite you to add in any libations or foodstuffs that you find appropriate. And tonight we'll also welcome your questions on Facebook during the event or afterwards. And during the event, we'll try to answer a few questions as they come in if possible. We're joined here in America's uh, virtual living room, AKA Zoom, by a group of friends of the Committee of 70, local civic leaders who volunteered to be the guinea pigs in this experiment. So let's meet them. Um, first up, Jen. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me in your virtual living room. <laughs> um, I'm Jen Poor. I'm a, a Civic, I'm, I like to refer to myself as a voting enthusiast. I'm very civically engaged. Um, I'm a former Buckholz Fellow, which was, um, which is a program out of Committee 70 um, to harness civic engagement among amongst young people. Um, and then last year, I ran for City Commissioner, the office that oversees all elections. Uh, spoiler alert, I did not win, but I ran a great race and I'm excited to still continue to do the work. So thank you for having me. Thanks. And Jenna will be serving as one of our co-hosts tonight. And I'm going to go counterclockwise on my screen, which may not be your screen, and go to my friend Joanne Fisher. Hi, I'm Joanne Fisher, and I ran for a delegate for Elizabeth Warren, and I have been engaged as um, a staff person, a volunteer, and um, a voter for a very long time. 
Thanks, Joanne. Next, uh, Salman. Hi, everybody. Absolute pleasure to, to be with you all today. Um, as Chris mentioned, my name is Solomon Moreno Rosa. I am a principal at a social impact consulting firm by the name of Envoy Growth Advisory. Uh, I am a former board member for Young Involved Philadelphia. I am a current Buckholtz Fellow. And in addition to my touch points with C70, I also serve on the Eastern Steering Committee for Draw the Lines, which is a statewide campaign to educate provide resources and digital tools for Pennsylvanians to become more engaged in the uh, drawing of map process for the state writ large. And I uh, appreciate being uh, being with you all today. Thanks, Solomon. And Buckholz Fellows are the Committee of 70's program for rising leaders to get an experience with the board. Um, continuing uh, the connection of Young Involved Philadelphia alumni, Claire robertson Kraft. Hi everyone, uh, Claire Robertson Craft. Uh, I am the founder and executive director of an organization called Impact Ed, which is based out of the University of Pennsylvania. We work with nonprofits and public sector agencies. Uh, so generally, I consider myself a Philly civic enthusiast. Uh, and as Chris mentioned, I think my passion for Philadelphia actually began uh, back when I was involved with Young Involved Philadelphia when I was young, um, back in the day. Um, I'm very excited to be here with all of you today. Thanks, Claire. Next, Kellen. Uh, thanks for having me. As Chris said, my name is Kellen White. Uh, I am a recovering uh, campaign staffer, uh, optimistic public servant, and I've been the chap director for New Year's Council for about seven years now. So happy to be here. Thanks. Jason? Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be here in, in Philadelphia's living room. Uh, my name is Jason Tucker. I am also a former member of the Board of Young Involved Philadelphia, uh, also a former Buckholz Fellow, and I'm a veteran poll watcher. So when it comes to civics, I, I just want to make sure that we drag people kicking and screaming or smiling and cheering all into the process because we need everyone out there. So civics cheerleader extraordinary. Thanks, Jason. And Teresa? Hello, everyone. I'm Teresa Gavigan. I'm an attorney and labor relations consultant by day and a volunteer in my spare time, which is really where my passion lies. I'm currently on uh, four nonprofit uh, boards, including Leadership Philadelphia and Philadelphia Theater Company. I also, uh, one of my volunteer activities for a long period of time was as a committee person in the fifth ward, uh, sixth division in Center City. So I'm really passionate about the importance of voting and uh, how it can really impact folks' lives. And thanks again to all of you for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it. And as I mentioned, um, when we talk about voting, we're talking about plugging into uh, an American legacy that's more than 200 years old. And as I mentioned, we wanted to connect back, um, get you connected back in a way to some of the heroes who, um, whose struggles made it possible for us to have the freedom to vote. So we have a few quotes from some of those folks and we'd like to just read them to you. I think the first one that's up will be from Jen DeVore. Okay, why we vote. That vote of yours has cost millions of dollars and the lives of thousands of women. Women have suffered agony of soul which you never can comprehend that you and your daughters might inherit political freedom. That vote has been costly, prize it. The vote is a power, a weapon of offense and defense, a prayer. Progress is calling you to make no pause, act. And that is from Carrie Chapman, Cat, an American suffragette, the movement that uh, first uh, was successful in getting, uh, well, women, but white women, particularly the, the right to vote and, and paved the way for more to come. A hundred years ago today. Yeah, quick note, 100 years ago today, uh, today or thereabouts. Is it today? Thereabouts. Roughly today. R roughly today. Roughly today. And uh, there's actually a terrific book I read a little, a uh, couple weeks ago called The Women's Hour, which is about the struggle to secure the last uh, state uh, to uh, ratify the amendment. And uh, it's, it's filled with all the drama you'd expect. So highly recommend that. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Next, some words from someone we certainly hope you know, it's Solomon. Great. Why we vote. I thought I was going to die on this bridge, 
but somehow, in some way, God Almighty help me. We must keep the faith, keep our eyes on the prize. We must go out and vote like we never, ever voted before. Some people gave more than a little blood. Some gave their very lives. U.S. Representative John Lewis on the 55th anniversary of Bloody Sunday in Selma. And that photo is of a younger, much younger John Lewis actually on that day in Selma back in the 1960s. Next up from Jason. Why we vote. But if I fall, I'll fall five feet, four inches forward in the fight for freedom. I'm not backing off. Fannie Lou Hammer, civil rights activist. And for those of you for whom that name is not familiar, she is a giant of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s, who stands to be recognized and known along with some of the more familiar men from that time. Next up, from a different age, Teresa. Why we vote, the philosophical view. Just because you do not take an interest in politics doesn't mean politics won't take an interest in you. And that goes back to a wise man from the cradle of democracy, um, ancient Athens. And now to own face, if you ask me. Yeah, I, we tried so hard to talk David out of making that joke, but it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't successful. And now to move to a more modern philosopher, Stephen Colbert, The View from the Late Show. Can't wait for tomorrow when I get to exercise my patriotic duty as an American, complaining about how long it's taking to vote. Well, we're not going to worry, have to worry about that too much because we'll be voting from home this time. But we wanted to ask the members of our little group here if they will, maybe wanted to share a story from a time when they did stand in those lines to vote. One that, um, a time they voted that was particularly memorable or meaningful. Um, Jen, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I mean, I have a couple, um, you know, I, in addition to, um, you know, the, the kind of volunteer work that I mentioned earlier. I've also been um, an election board worker um, and I'm a committee person as well in the 36. So I've seen my fair share of elections. Um, I think the most memorable, memorable time that I voted was the first time I voted for myself. It wasn't when I ran for commissioner last year, but it was back in 2014 when I ran for committee person. Um, and it was like really exciting. I wore a suit and I brought my daughter um, and, and it was great. And uh, I just, it was a really great feeling. So that, that's one of my most memorable times. Yeah, thanks. Anyone else want to share a story? Just jump in. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess for me, you know, I, uh, my first election I got to vote in was Kerry um, Bush. Actually, no, it was uh, the Kerry primary and Kerry Bush. But what stands out most to me is the um, Barack Obama general election. And so mm -hmm. I lived in um, this warm place called Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, where winter starts in like August. And I remember getting up at 6 a.m. and, you know, going out in the deep snow to stand in line with a bunch of college students. I worked at University of Minnesota at the time. And just seeing um, how many younger people was the first time voting, the, the sheer number of African-Americans standing in line before the sun was even up on a college campus where you could just tell they were doing this not just for themselves, but for the, uh, their ancestors and, and their families that came before them. And that just always stick out in my mind because it was such a historic time. And, and then with the backdrop of being in such a cold, miserable uh, situation standing outside, but it didn't deter people. And it was something that that energy, I hope to see at every election and, and maybe one day we'll get there. So I'll go next because I actually have the opposite experience of the frigid weather in Minneapolis. I grew up in Texas. And so November, any time of year in Texas, it's like an 80 degree day, probably. So my first memory of voting is actually one of my first memories of my life. Um, I think I must have been five or six years old. And it was the first time or the first time I remember my mom taking me to vote. Um, and my parents are very uh, we're still are slash were at the time activists and very involved in um, politics and civic life. And so I remember um, standing in line um, <laughs> voting in Texas and our line was a lot shorter than the other line. This is the memory I have as a five or six year old because I was a Democrat in a predominantly Republican area 
uh, of Texas. Because I remember asking my mom, why is our line so much shorter than th this other line? Everyone's over here in this line. Um, and she sort of explained to me, uh, and that was my, one of my, literally one of my first memories. Um, and I think at age five or six, I got really interested and engaged in civic life. Um, not just because our line was shorter, but because I'd like, gone out with my mom and it was such an important part of their, of their civic uh, and their community experience. Well, I will date myself, perhaps carbon date myself by saying that the first election I voted in was um, Nixon, uh, was well, 1972, Richard Nixon's re-election. Uh, in the wake of Watergate, and it was pretty much a foregone conclusion um, who was going to win that by the time McGovern. the election. Well, yeah, McGovern. Um, for almost everyone in America, but my father, who was a Democratic ward leader and, and loyal party soldier back home in Ohio. So the night before the election, he was willing to bet me 10 bucks that McGovern was going to win. Um, and I needed the pizza money, so I took the old man's bet. Um, but then walked you know, to take my first vote of my adult life for a presidential election, knowing that the candidate I was going to vote for had no chance, but realized when I did it that it didn't matter. It, it meant so much to have a chance to take part in that process that it wasn't about winning or losing. It was about at least registering your vote. And I did vote at college in Massachusetts, or I was able to put that bumper sticker on my car, don't blame me, I'm from Massachusetts, because it was the only state that went for George McGovern in that electoral college. Uh, anyone else have one? We probably have time for one more story, Jason. Yeah, I, I remember specifically going with my parents, as I feel uh, is one of the first experiences voting that a lot of folks have. Um, and I remember my parents being super voters and, and asking them why we'd always show up to vote. And, you know, they, they took it very, very dutifully and they explained to me that we vote every time because there's so many people who were not afforded this right and they sacrificed for years and years in order to give us the opportunity to even have this opportunity to, to get up and do this. So we do it for the people who came before us and they looked at it as a duty, um, a civic duty, but also a personal one. So I, I take it seriously and I hope that everyone uh, out there thinks of their, their place in the history of what they're doing. Great, thank you, Jason. Uh, anybody else want to share before we move on? Hey, hey uh, Chris, just to put a pin in it, it's interesting that what we heard here was a couple stories about, about family, about childhood, about how this is all part of it, which is exactly what we're trying to encourage through this We Vote initiative, to get people to think of this, as Jason said, as a, a part of their identity, a part of your culture. This is like what you do. It's not just a transaction. It's... Um, it's, it's something you, you believe in and, and feel obligated uh, to, uh, to engage in. So good stuff. Okay, well, David, you have the floor, so why don't you keep it and take us through some of the background and some of the myths and mechanics of uh, voting from home. Sure. Um, well, actually, just to sort of continue the thread, I mean, what we're sort of trying to figure out and the, the point of this uh, little get-together is is how we can imbue the voting at home process with everything we've talked about with the voting uh, in person process, because this is an extraordinary election and an extraordinary time uh, under extraordinary circumstances. Um, I think we all know, I hope everybody, lots of folks out there know that the state of Pennsylvania approved the ability for all of us to vote at home with no excuse. Uh, proved that last fall, the governor and the legislature it was kind of a happy accident because uh, they had no idea in October of last year that there was this thing called a, a pandemic uh, coming up. Um, but uh, that's given us the ability to uh, to vote in a very new and and um, and high impact kind of a way. Just a, a couple of things about voting at home. Um, I guess at this point, the important thing to remember is. If you vote uh, at home, you have to get your ballot to your local election officials by 8 p.m. on election day. Now, if I were you, I'd feel okay dropping it in the mail maybe tomorrow, but with every day, every hour after that, you get a little jittery about, you know, what the post office is up to and so forth and so on. I'm here to tell you that tomorrow in Philadelphia, 
the city commissioners are going to announce drop-off locations um, spread throughout the city and not to spoil the fun, but there will also be, let's just say, some mobile drop-off locations involving the backdrop that's right behind me, which is the virtual Volkswagen. Um, so stay tuned for that announcement. Very exciting. And uh, this will make it possible for you to drop your uh, ballot in a secure location without having to go through all the rigmarole of a mail and, and chase down something called a stamp uh, and, uh, and find a post office box and so forth. So that's the story as of now. But again, it has to be in the hands of election officials 8 p.m. June 2nd. Okay, and for those of you who don't know it, that backdrop for David is his own beloved Volkswagen bus, which I guess is now being drafted into the holy cause. Yeah, that's right. Well, it's been itching to get out of the driveway. That's all I know. The <laughs> neighbors actually are itching to get it out of the driveway. I'm oh, sure. So, David, can you take us through some things sure. that rile you? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, this is a, a, a new experience voting by mail. First time I've ever done it. Uh, and uh, I think the count in Pennsylvania is probably up to about 1.2, 3, 4 million, maybe 170,000 people in, in Philadelphia, which is maybe the order of 12 or 15 times as much voting by mail as we've ever had in Pennsylvania. So just let that sit for a second. And maybe quite um, rightly, people uh, have concerns about that. And let me just walk through uh, three myths that are out there about vote by mail and see if we can sort of puncture that balloon. So, uh, Chris, do we have a next slide or am I just sort of talking through this? Yeah, there you go. We ah, got them all. Okay. <laughs> just let me know when you want them. Okay, I'll, I'll tug on my ear. How about that? That's good. Um, first of all, voter fraud. Very rare, and there's no evidence that voting by mail encourages it or, or enables it. If you want to, like, drill into the research, um, you can, the, the best site that I've come across is actually factcheck.org, which is at the University of Pennsylvania. They do a neat summary of the research that's out there. Extraordinarily rare. Uh, just, just doesn't happen. And by the way, we have about 25 years of experience of voting in five states that have done this, primarily vote by mail. Although keep in mind that the whole notion of voting by mail originated during World War II because we wanted soldiers to be able to vote. So if it's good enough for the military, it should be good enough for all of us. So let's go to number two. Number two on the hit parade. Um, it will count if, as I said, you get it in the hands of the election officials by 8 p.m. on election night. Now, the other question is, how do I know that there aren't you know, seven ballots coming in from some guy named Jason Tucker or Claire Robertson Kraft. Well, here's the story. Each voter uh, who requests a vote by mail ballot uh, gets a, a ballot that has a unique barcode on it that identifies that ballot uh, as belonging to you. And if two of those come in, which they, sh they won't, but if for some reason they did, then the first one counts and the second one doesn't. Easy enough. The other thing is you can track the progress of your the journey of your uh, uh, of your mail ballot if you give the Department of State your email address. By this point, it's kind of academic. You just hope that you'll get the email that says it's been uh, received, signed, sealed, and delivered, and is ready for counting. So let's go on to number three. David, as luck would have it, I happen to get that email from the Department of State today. So I Just have... under the wire. Yeah. Just under the wire. So there's also somehow somehow uh, 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 the notion put out there that uh, voting by mail is a partisan plot by one party. And here is the story. Again, 25 years of research. Uh, it turns out that voting by mail, voting at home, doesn't advantage either party. It, it, it actually splits kind of down the middle, which sort of makes sense if you think about it, because that's the makeup of uh, the American electorate. It's, you know, sort of 49-51 or 50-50 uh, across the country. So rest assured, there's no partisan plot. It doesn't advantage uh, one party or the other. Just if you hear somebody say that, hold your ears. Um, uh, it's like the siren song. It just, it just isn't true. It does bump up turnout a little bit for both sides, which is a good thing. But Again, there's no heavy-handed partisan advantage 
uh, to either side. So that's, uh, I hope gives you a little confidence in uh, this whole new process. And um, we stand ready to talk people through uh, the, the mechanics and, and, the, and the whys and wherefores as, uh, as we near the deadline. Okay, thanks very much, David. Can I just add to David, to your point, like this is new to us, but it's not new to other states that have been doing this successfully, right? I don't have the statistics offhand, but I mean, how many other states have been doing vote by mail previously? Does anyone well, know? Yeah, there, there are five states, all yeah. West Coast states. Sure. The oldest of them is Oregon. This goes back to 1995. So 25 years they've been voting by mail. Mm -hmm. And one thing is, is true. People like it. Yeah. You ask well, seventy percent of them, give or take, say, "Yeah, I, I enjoy it. I like the chance to sit at my kitchen table, take my time, talk to my neighbors, research candidates." Uh, so, yeah, this is not new. In fact, I saw today twenty-five percent of all votes, by and large, that are cast in America come uh, through the mail these days. So it's a it's a really growing trend. Joanne, you want to jump in? I did. I, I already voted and I today I, I received notification that my vote has been accepted. Um, but I saw a lot like a take home test. Whereas, um, you know, when I'm at the polls, th there's people behind me, I feel a little rushed. In this case, I could sit here and research the various candidates. I was on LinkedIn. It was a much more relaxing and thorough process for me. Thank you. And so I'm gonna turn it over to our self-declared resident voting geek, Chen, to take you through the do's and don'ts of doing this right. <laughs> I'm an enthusiast. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so you know, many of you, hopefully if you are planning on voting by mail, you were able to get your application in today or possibly you already have your ballot um, in hand like so many of us have talked about today. Um, this election is a primary, so you're going to pick candidates within your party if you're registered as a Democrat or a Republican. If you're registered as an independent, you can absolutely still vote um, for the questions. Um, there's two charter questions on the ballot. Um, and that's what you'll see when you get, um, we know when you get your package in the mail. And then on the next slide, yep, so this is actually live footage from my house. This was my, before I filled it out, because you're supposed to fill it out privately. Um, but I thought it would be helpful because if people haven't gotten their ballot yet, they can see kind of what's in the package, right? So you have your ballot. Um, you have a security envelope, which you're supposed to put your ballot in first, then the actual envelope to mail it back. It also comes with instructions, um, which we'll go over some of the highlights here. Um, and then it comes out by law, you have to have, um, you know, kind of like an a easy version of the, of the charter questions because they're written in such a complex matter, which is something that I could go on and on about, but I won't today. Um, so there is a breakdown. And of course, if you're at home and you have access to a computer, you can look at the Committee of 70 Voter Guide for more nonpartisan guidance on that. Um, so when filling out your ballot, make sure that you have blue or black ink. Um, you wanna fill out both sides um, too. So just make sure that you do that. I, I actually, you know, Joanne, it was interesting to hear your story about being relaxed. Voting at home made me like, because it felt like a test made me a little nervous. And I didn't have like an election board to answer any of my questions. So um, I was, I, I really had to focus and make sure I got all my, my bubbles in right and the whole thing. Um, when you turn it over, you'll see if you are registered with a specific party, you'll have a chance to vote for delegates, which we'll talk about. Um, but make sure you know that you can vote for up to 14 delegates. Um, you can't really cross anything out or erase anything. So again, just make sure that you're, um, you're concentrating on, on how you mark it. Um, and then you want, when you're done, you wanna put your ballot in the secrecy envelope, that white envelope, um, that I guess they're all white, right? But the official election ballot, it says it right there. Um, that's so it doesn't get, it's like extra tampering protection, right? So you put it in that envelope and then you put that envelope in the um, in the return envelope, which you don't need a stamp to mail back. So postage is paid is paid for that, which we're very lucky to have. Um, and you fill out um, the back. You sign it, 
um, and then you write your address. And then as David mentioned, um, there is a code with your information on the other side. So they, uh, you know, the county commissioners want to just make sure that it all matches up and then you stick it in the mail. The secrecy envelope, I mean, I don't know if anyone that's watching this at live home that's done this wants to share what their experience was like, but I had a couple of people call or text me in a panic that they didn't know what to do. They forgot to put the secrecy envelope in. Um, a couple of people were concerned about licking an envelope because of, because of the pandemic that we're in. So they were asking if we could put tape on it. Um, so just make sure that you're, like I said, just like you're, you're in a calm setting, you're focused on it and it will all be okay. It, it felt great sticking it in the mailbox though, once it was done. So. Thanks, Jen. Yeah. And David, you want to tell folks about where they can get all the information that we're presenting tonight and more. Sure. As, as part of We Vote, uh, we've assembled, I think, a world-class set of resources for all voters in Pennsylvania. We've uh, we've taken the step of moving out of Philadelphia and the region. So this is available to everybody that votes in Pennsylvania. Um, and un, if you go to wevote.70.org, you can find all these resources. You can learn about the candidates. Uh, you can learn about ballot issues. And, and maybe most important, um, we have an, a cool little tool called BYO Ballot, uh, uh, credit to Jen DeVore when she was a Buckholz Fellow for coming up with that name. And it allows you to make your picks about who you wanna vote for, and then essentially send it to yourself on your phone or share it to Facebook or Twitter or whatever you wanna do with it. Not required, but if you wanna do that, you can, you can do it. The other thing is um, through the We Vote initiative, uh, we've done a lot of um, uh, recorded Facebook Live interviews with pretty much all the candidates, at least for statewide office. So um, to, uh, to Joanne's point, if you want to kick back and uh, get yourself educated, not about who these folks appear to be, but also um, uh, to uh, uh, see what these folks, these candidates look like up close in person, you can go to our Facebook page and find them there or to our YouTube channel. Uh, but all good stuff. I'm, we're really proud of what we're doing. By the way, anybody wants to ask a question, just uh, speaking of Facebook, just fire away and uh, and uh, we'll try to do our best to, to respond to those, whether it involves secrecy envelopes or not. Okay, hey, thanks, David. And sort of under the old teaching advice to tell them what you're gonna say, then say it. Now let's sort of go through the kind of resource, some of a taste of the resources you'll find on the Committee of 70 site. So what's up for grabs this time? What's at stake? Uh, of course, President of the United States and convention delegates, and Joanne will tell us a little bit more about some of the ins and outs of that in a second. Um, we're, wherever you are, you're voting for a member of the United States House. We're also voting for what are known as the state row offices, Attorney General, Auditor General, and Treasurer. And in a moment, we'll tell you a little bit more about what those people do. And we're voting um, for many members of the General Assembly. Our House of Representatives in Pennsylvania has 203 members. All of them are up for election. And our Senate has 50 members and half of them up for, are up for election. So let's just review what these people do. President of the United States um, is probably the one you're most familiar with. Not too much drama in the election this time. The candidates for both major parties are pretty well determined at this point. But you're still going to face the opportunity or have the opportunity to vote for delegates to the two party conventions. So um, there's a picture of delegates from um, the last Republican convention. You have to wear funny hats. That's yeah, the... yeah. Funny hats are an essential part of the entire gestalt of the experience. But Joanne, um... I'll never do it. <laughs> <laughs> Joanne, can you tell us a little bit about your experience of getting on the ballot and now not being on the ballot, and what's going on with that ballot? Get out of uh, mute. You got to unmute yourself. Yeah. Sure. Um, this is probably the area that uh, people know the least about, and. Uh, I jumped into it not knowing very much myself, except that I was very frustrated and I felt like I needed to do something. And having volunteered at the convention in Philadelphia um, last time, I thought, well, I'd like to go to the convention in Milwaukee. Um, and 
sold as a way I could take to stand. And it did force me to choose my candidate and garner support by getting at least 250 signatures, but you have to get a lot more. And um, ran around with a lot of delegate uh, wannabes who for all the various um, candidates at that point in time. Now, um, Jen mentioned that uh, people voted for 14 delegates. That actually is only in some congressional districts. Every congressional district gets at least, uh, are supposedly the same size and get 10 delegates. Uh, a couple of congressional districts that have um, a lot of people voting regularly and um, um, traditionally good turnout um, get some extra spots. But in the region, most of the um, uh, people will vote for up to 10 delegates. Now, the, the role of the delegate in a contested convention is they vote and in the first round of voting for the various candidates, people are committed to their candidate. And then in the second round, they can vote for um, what, a, what a other candidate um, is still uh, in the race. However, like now in an uncontested um, uh, race, they're basically the cheering section for the campaign TV kickoff. And um, that's their big role. Um, and the delegates may be selected by the party to serve on a credentials or a platform committee. Um, and then that gives them a more important role. But for most delegates, it's a, a cheering section. Um, on the Pennsylvania ballot, there are uh, choices for both um, uh, Biden and Sanders. And that is a little confusing since Sanders has withdrawn from the election. Uh, however, there's kind of a difference between withdrawing and suspending and Sanders intentionally stayed on the ballot because he wanted um, to have more delegates. However, his delegates will not, even if they get the most votes, won't be elected unless Sanders gets at least 15% of the vote. So, and in my county, for example, Biden doesn't even have 10 people. So what happens then? Um, the party will select people who best reflect the makeup of the congressional district. Also in Pennsylvania, it's 50-50 women and men. So again, it, when you vote for delegate, you're helping see who gets the most votes, but it does not necessarily mean there'll be a delegate. That is determined by the number of votes and the makeup of the congressional district. Hey, I don't know if anybody else feels this way, but the whole delegate selection process makes the electoral college look like linear and straightforward and easy to understand. It may be uh, past its expiration date, if you ask me, but so what? So you get to vote for them this time around. And this time they may or may not get to go to Milwaukee. And <laughs> First prize, just, three days in Milwaukee. Second prize, a week. They may just get a chance to go on to Zoom, just like we are tonight. So let's look at some of the other races. As we mentioned, um, United States House, everyone is up for election, so you will have a chance to vote for your party's nominee for the November general election. The House of Representatives obviously had a somewhat reluctant moment in the sun earlier this year when it was um, carrying out one of its rarer powers, impeachment, but normally it's the place where money bills, appropriations and tax bills get started. We do not have a Senate race this year in Pennsylvania. So the next highest office in a way that's up for grabs is the Attorney General of Pennsylvania, who is Pennsylvania's chief law enforcement officer uh, responsible for prosecuting criminal charges brought by the Commonwealth, as well as some civil litigation, has some enforcement powers over consumer protection and charities, 
and um, also represents the government in actions brought against it. The salary of this position is 158,764, as is the salary for all the row offices. David, you want to tell us about Auditor General? Well, sure. The Auditor General is sort of the chief watchdog. Um, makes they they si similar to the city controller here in in Philadelphia. Uh, they audit public funds, so sort of watching the money go by and making sure that it's well spent. And then, if they they also can do what's called performance audits, which is not just you know making sure the money landed in the right place, but it was spent well and that produced value for the taxpayer. So that is an open seat, by the way. It's a six-way race on the Democratic side, and there's one a Republican candidate. So uh, that's that's one. Most of these row offices, frankly, are uh, uncontested in the primary. So this is one where there's a lot of action. And Jen, uh, as a mother, you have a special interest in one of the programs run by the Treasurer's Office. So why don't you tell us about that? <laughs> oh, the college savings. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. The future of college is... So going to be so <laughs> radical, I think. I'm not worried about, I mean, we're going to do like YouTube you, you know. Uh, <laughs> so the PA treasurer, uh, their, you know, their primary responsibility is to safeguard and manage nearly a hundred billion dollars in state funds. Um, they're, you know, they're managing our investments, um, you know, helping to generate income on behalf of citizens, um, and much like the auditor, making sure that everything's clean, corruption free, and, um, you know, the numbers add up as they should. Um, some popular programs among residents are the college savings program, as you mentioned, Chris, and the unclaimed property program. Just on the call, like raise your hand if you've gotten money from unclaimed property. I, if you have not applied yet, I mean, there is money out there with your name on it. I, I can't guarantee you, but the chances are high. So um, trust me, that's something to look into. I think it's also important to note too that, you know, we have the salaries on all these slides. And this is something that I feel is really important and something that I've learned from Committee of 70 is really that, you know, when we, we as voters are hiring a, um, candidates to, to do a job, that's what an elected official is. We, we hire them to get the job done and we pay their salary. And so I think it's important to know how much our elected officials are getting paid. That is no means to criticize the dollar amount, but just to put it in perspective and to take jobs seriously, as David mentioned, some of these row offices that people may not really um, pay attention to for the election or know a lot about, I think it's encouraging um, to, to really get a full understanding of what these people are doing since they we are hiring them. Um, and I'll just give a shout out, the PA treasurer has a great Twitter account um, so definitely, if you're on uh, social media, follow them. Thanks, Jed. Getting back to uh, legisl legislative offices in Harrisburg, the PA Senate and the PA House, here are some of the details. Again, 50 senators, half of whom are being elected this time around, and the House of Representatives. Just want to say, you know, like, there sometimes is a lack of attention paid to state lawmakers in legislative races. But if you care about any of the following things, how your children are educated, either K through 12 or in college, what tuition is at Penn State, at Temple, or any, other, any parts of the state university system, if you care about clean water or clean air, if you care about whether your roads are maintained, a whole host, a host of really close to home issues are all taken care of and determined to a large degree by these 253 people, the 50 senators and the 203 state representatives. So it's well worth your time and attention to figure out who you want to hire, as Jen says, to do those jobs for you. So that's the rundown of the ballot and how to fill out the ballot. Um, we wanted to spend a moment. Um, first, uh, Jen, have you noticed on chat any questions that we should deal with? You're muted, Jen. I'm not seeing the chat, but I, whoever is doing the tech might have a better. Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, we'll hang on for that. So, yeah. Chris, I actually got got one. Uh, okay, good. Um, this is a common question. What's the difference between an absentee ballot and a mail-in ballot? Um, there really isn't any. Uh, the absentee ballot is sort of the old form where you had to have an excuse. But for constitutional reasons, when the state wanted to 
extend this option to more voters, they, they couldn't get rid of the absentee ballot option, so they just added to it. So there are now two things, one called an absentee ballot, one called a mail ballot. Um, the, the short story is just apply for a mail ballot because you don't have to have an excuse, and but they're, they're treated and processed just the same. It's admittedly confusing, but, but blame it on our constitution and how difficult it is to change our constitution. Okay, thanks, David. So I want to go back to our panel one last time to ask a slightly different question, whether anybody has any thoughts about what it means in particular to them to be voting in this moment amid pandemic and all, and, you know, massive unemployment, tremendous threats to our nation. Um, how is this responsibility and privilege of being a voter settling on your shoulders right now? Well, I mean, Chris, I think it's, as we all live through this pandemic, the question becomes, what is the new normal, right? And when can we go back to living our lives like we used to? And, you know, voting, I, you know, I know my vote was counted. I got the email today as well. Being able to vote sort of from home is, even though it's from home, some normalcy in life, right? As someone who's a super voter, like probably everybody on this panel, I've never missed an election. And this pandemic might have postponed the election. And God bless my friends who are running for office who suddenly had like an extra four weeks to run. Um, but, you know, we're still being able to do it. So still being able to exercise our right to vote. And as we head into this primary and the general election, it's going to be important that we still participate in government because we are relying heavily on government to, to guide us through this pandemic. So we should all be heavily involved in choosing who leads our government. Thanks, Kellen. Teresa, I don't want to put you on the spot, but we haven't heard too much from you today. Do you have any thoughts? Unmute. <laughs> Teresa, you're unmuted. You're still on mute. So while while Teresa is figuring out mic issues, I'll quickly just just Sorry. add as as a reminder that you know we we are in a census year and we've got right uh, reapportionment taking place right around the corner, um, which which I really think just just speaks to the importance of high engagement now. Really speaks to the importance of really instilling this this mindset of strong civic engagement. Because really, I mean, this, this is a year that's going to set the landscape for the next 10 years. And so being as vigilant and, and being as informed as possible really makes a difference um, now, you know, more so, more so than ever. So really just kind of keeping that at the forefront of all of our thinking as to why it is we, we do this work that we're, we're so heavily involved in. Thanks, Alma. Teresa. I apologize. Um, I uh, lost my screen there for a second. I just think it's so important at this time that, uh, that it's a really important decision that we get to make to choose the candidate who can help work to heal. Obviously, they can't do it by themselves, but work to heal the country, both economic, uh, economically, physically, you know, through, uh, through uh, health care initiatives, and also psychologically. So I just feel like this is such an important election. It's really important for everyone to vote. Thanks so much, uh, Teresa. So we wanted to bring you home by trying something. Uh, I was doing a, a civic dialogue event a couple of weeks ago where there was a young man from Gettysburg uh, in the group that I was, where I was leading the discussion. And we were asking what assets his community had to take care of a certain problem. And he said, well, the biggest asset I have as a resident of Gettysburg is I live near the sacred ground where the whole point and the whole goal of what we're doing in America was laid out. So 272 words in the Gettysburg Address spoken 157 years ago. And they thought, we thought in this moment of national crisis and division, we would say them together. So together in our Zoom living room, we're going to go through the Gettysburg Address, starting with Kellen. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent, a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicates their proposition that all men are treated equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation 
or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did there, here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. David, take us home. You're muted. Okay. Yeah, it's a little humbling uh, and intimidating to follow those beautiful 272 words. <laughs> Anything you say is going to sound uh, incredibly uh, prosaic. Um, but first of all, thanks to you, Chris, and, and to all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, again, we hope to convey a little information, a little inspiration, a little energy uh, about this election and, and how we vote in these extraordinary times. Um, one of the, th we, we've all talked about what voting means to us. Um, one of the things that occurred to me as, as we were forming this We Vote initiative is uh, it, 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 it struck me that, um, that uh, when we, we talk about voting, or we head to the polls or vote at our kitchen table, it, it maybe is the one time in this country where everyone is equal. We all get one vote, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're black, whether you're right, whether you're Hispanic, uh, straight, gay, whatever, everybody gets one vote. And I think that is the, the beauty of this American experiment uh, and uh, one that we remind ourselves of and that we strengthen every time we, we cast that vote. So our hope is that, um, uh, and I expect uh, this is going to be a, a very active, energetic political season. Uh, the primary on June 2nd is kind of a warm up, warm up. it's kind of batting practice for the main event, um, but uh, extraordinarily important. And we are, uh, with all of you, just trying to do our part to make sure that you are uh, fully prepared uh, to engage in this, uh, in this great tradition and this great responsibility. So um, stay tuned, uh, wevote.70.org. Uh, thanks again to all of you for joining us. And as Chris said at the outset, we encourage you to steal this playbook if you're watching us on Facebook Live and, um, and put it to your own uh, good uses. And uh, we'll be back um, in, uh, in the fall, uh, maybe to uh, conduct a few more rounds of this, uh, of this little experiment in strengthening local democracy. So with that, unless there's any further uh, words from the from the Hollywood squares. <laughs> uh, we'll um, bid you all good night and uh, go grab yourself a drink and maybe a little dinner. Thanks. Thanks to you all.